Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rajiv S. Khanna from immigration.com, the law offices of Rajiv S. Khanna, PC. Today is September 22nd. Uh, we do a community conference call every other Thursday. Everybody is welcome to join. People post their questions online in the forums, and I answer those questions first. Uh, please also join us on Twitter. You can go to immigration.com. You'll see that all our social media participation is right on the top. Uh, immigration.com top panel. You can join us with, on Facebook as well as Twitter. I'm also monitoring my tweets live, just keeping track of anybody wanting to reach us through Twitter while I'm talking. Okay, that said, let's get started with today's questions. I will first deal with the questions that have been marked as a frequently asked question by me. Then we'll deal with follow-ups on those questions. Then we'll start on the posted questions. Then do follow-ups on posted questions. And then if time permits, we will go over new questions. I have, I think I see a name that I recognize online. This is the case of a registered nurse. I think you sent me an email. Your name looks familiar. Let me unmute you. Say hello. The nurse whose 485 got denied. Say hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I've got yes, you. Uh, they I showed me. You. They showed me your email this morning, and I received your email as well. I have told them to give you 15 minutes time. I'll go over your case with you separately. This is not something we can do in an open conference. There's confidentiality here. So go ahead and wait for my office. They'll be contacting you today. I've told them to contact you. Okay. Okay, sir, I'll do that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I don't want to do this in an open conference with you. So we'll just talk separately. No problem. You can hang up. Okay, Okay, sir. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay and listen if you like. But, you, you, I mean, we'll talk separately for you. All right, guys. That said, let's begin with the uh, frequently asked question number one. What is the effect of divorce on an employment-based immigration? So divorce by itself has no consequences. Divorce is a civil proceeding that has no consequences on immigration. Once you've got your immigration, if you get divorced, it is absolutely not a problem. This gentleman is worried about, Bharat is worried about whether there'll be a problem in citizenship and the answer is no, not for you, not for your wife, not for your children. Divorce is absolutely no problem for immigration once you have obtained it. Now, in another situation, if a 485 was pending and before the 485 could be approved, the parties were going to get divorced, you would have consequences because then the derivative spouse cannot really inherit the immigration of the primary applicant. That becomes much more complicated. Any follow-up questions on this? Press star five on your phone. No new questions, only follow-ups. And the tail end of your question is that whether US laws would be applied for divorce or Indian laws. That's beyond my area of practice. You should contact a domestic relations lawyer in the state where you live. I cannot answer that question. Okay. Let's go on to the next frequently asked question. This also comes up quite frequently. Abhishek Verma wants to know, can a student on F1 visa apply for a green card? And the answer is sure. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. But remember, an F1 visa is the kind of non-immigrant visa where non-immigrant intention is required. So if you file a green card, basically, you are exhibiting immigrant intent. What you're doing is you're telling the government, I want to convert to a green card. I want to do a green card. So at a certain stage, if you do, for example, PERM-based filing, when PERM is approved, an I-140 is filed. Or if you do EB-1 or an NIW, where an I-140 is filed directly, filing of I-140 becomes proof of immigrant intent. What does that mean? That means 
you could have trouble traveling, you could have problems that should be very carefully discussed with your lawyers. But technically, especially for somebody like you, where your birthplace is a small country in North Africa and your dates would be current, I don't think it is undoable. I think it's possible to do it without too much risk to you. But please discuss it with your lawyers, plan it carefully. I don't have any problem with filing for a green card in a situation like yours. Any questions or follow-up questions on this particular area of inquiry, star five, press star five on your phone. No new questions, please, star five. For those of you who've just joined us, I'm inviting you to please join us on social media as well. If you go to immigration.com, you will see on the top ribbon our YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of these entries. I, I'm pretty active on Twitter and Facebook both. Okay, that said, next frequently asked question. Somebody's on L1 or H1. They want to help their parents apply for a tourist visa. Well, there really is no issue with that because first of all, tourist visa application does not require that there must be a family member living in the United States. People can get a tourist visa based upon their own strength but if you are on a tourist visa, or if you're on an H1 or L1, certainly consulate could question about your status, etc. And normally there is no problem just because a son or a daughter is on H1 or L1. That does not negatively, maybe even not positively affect a tourist visa application from the parents. Let's see what you're asking. You are a resident of India working for a US-based MNC multinational corporation for the last five years. You're coming on L1 visa, but mom is taking stage four cancer treatment. Sorry to hear that, sir. As treatment options are limited, I'm planning to bring her here. Can I apply for visas at the same time? Yes, of course. When you apply for your L1, you can apply for her B visa at the same time. We're not playing any games here with the government. We'll be upfront about it. Just tell them why she's coming. I think it's a very genuine case. Can my mother and father get 12 month duration? You can certainly ask for it. The duration is actually decided at the airport. When you land, you can ask the CBP officer to please give them extra time because she's undergoing treatment. But if they don't, if they only give her six months, you can certainly extend it. Use form five, I-539, I-539 and file the application for an extension about five months into their stay. Normally they'll be given six months. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, Vijay. Star five, okay. Let's go on to the next frequently asked question. Let us see, it doesn't look like, all right, let me look, look at the last question. I think we are done with the frequently asked questions, okay. Now I'm going to get started with the regular questions that were posted. So temp account says, I am an Indian on H1B expiring 2017, approved I-140 priority date Jan 2014. My current employer will file for H1B in the next couple of months. I wanna leave my current job for another job, in another industry from management consulting to investment banking. I've got MBA plus 10 plus years experience. What are the best options? Uh, you can have two employers apply for H1 at the same time. I don't see any problem with that. Should I wait for current employer to file next H1? No, I think you should go ahead and if you have a job, have them apply for your H1. If your current employer wants to file an extension, that's okay too. They don't have to because it's Feb 2017. It's still a ways off. So you can just have your current employer file. I'm sorry, rephrase that. Uh, you can just have your future employer file. Alternatively, should my new employer be filing my H1B? Yes, the answer is because the I-140 is approved, they should be able to get you three years of H1. 
Once you join the new employer, even if the old employer revokes the I-140, USCIS does not take away the H-1 that they have given you. But you need to start your green card all over again with the new employer, and you will keep your priority date. So this is so far the ruling of USCIS. And if you go to my blogs, you will find that on my blogs, there is uh, all this information that we've talked about. Two areas where which are important. If you go to immigration.com and look at the top panel, there is the FAQ on the top panel, and there is the blog. So if you go to these two places, you can find all this information. We have discussed this issue many, 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 many times before. Going back to, let me just check our tweets. Okay, new people joining us. Let's go back to our discussion. So that covers everything. You'll keep your priority date, and but you will not be able to extend your H1 again, so you've got to get your green card started. And the fact that you're going from management consulting to investment banking does not stop you from carrying forward your priority date. That is not a problem. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. One question, okay, let's go to that. I don't know where you're calling from. Looks like you have a voice over IP. Go ahead, what is your question? So a quick question is, um, one thing I missed saying was that, um, you know, in February of 2017, effective then, I'll go on to my seventh yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can be 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th year. It doesn't matter. Same law. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Let's just uh, go on with our questions. We've done this. New Hope 13, I like that handle. Advanced parole while 45 is pending and a 30 day gap in the H1B status. So Canadian citizen on a capped H1B, which ends in June, switching employers, there's gonna be a gap from June to August. Also H1B uh, cap exempt. then I-140 and 45 will be filed. The future employer will be filing for a new H-1B. Okay, so you're planning to be outside the US during those two, three months when you, don't, when you have a gap. So I know that valid H-1B holders do not need advanced parole if they travel outside the US. But does, does this apply to me as well because I've got, I'm going to have a gap? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't think anybody can give you that answer. So yeah, your concern is that if I leave USA during the gap, would I be able to use my H1 that comes later on? And my answer is, I don't know, and I think it's risky. Because if you travel without an advanced parole, if you have a 485 pending, and there is actually a gap in your H1 approvals, it could become a very technical issue, and I think it could become, uh, or it could come to a point where you would have to refile your 485 when you come back in, okay? so. You have two options, either don't take a break, stay in the United States, don't go outside USA. Then if your 485 is pending, even if there's a gap in your H1, it doesn't matter. The second option is to file the 485 after you come back or to refile the 485 after you come back. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this new hope, if you're here. Star five, okay. Let's go on to the next one. Krishna says, I came to India on H-1B extension stamp June 2016. So you've got an H-1B stamping slot for October 3rd. You are the multinational. You've got US salary coming to you. Will there be a problem because you've stayed in India and received US pay? 
no problem at all. If you are in India and receiving US pay, it is no problem. I have booked B2 for my parents. Is that a problem? No, as I told you before, earlier, that really B2 doesn't require anybody in USA. If you are here, great. If not, great. They should be able to make an application. Will they get it? I don't know. But certainly, your being in India or USA is relatively a minor issue. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this. Star 5. Okay. Raj says there was a court order for eviction from my apartment, which I found out later. It was in my credit report. Or it didn't show up in your credit report. Should I report this on my N-400? No, I see personal debts or civil debts, unless they are owed to government, are not an issue. And I don't even know where you would reveal it on N-400. There is no question like that. There shouldn't be. So I, Raj, I don't think, as, unless you have some other issues, this looks like a straightforward naturalization case. If you are nervous, you can get a lawyer, but I don't see this as an issue. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Star five. Okay. Kiruba Agar. Kiruba says H-1B visa good till September 30th. Extension is applied, but I've got to know now. Can I come back before my visa expires? Yes. While the extension is pending, you can travel. And while your visa is valid and you've got that job, you can come back. I have done my premium processing. If my extension is approved, can I travel with approval notice? Yes, they can. Yes, you can. Only thing you've got to be careful about is the extension because they might give you a, an I-94 which could overrule your subsequent extension. So then that needs to be organized. Discuss with your lawyers the best option for that. One of the options would be to go outside USA and come back. So just have to deal with that. Otherwise, coming back is not an issue. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, star 5. OK. This is Anto Vivek, who says, I'm in India, elder brother is a US citizen, filed I-130 in March 2014. How much time? Well, to, first of all, there are two kinds of times involved in cases. One is the priority date, which for you is about 13, 14 years backed up. So nothing is going to happen for 13, 14 years. Once your date becomes current, then the forms processing begins, like moving your file to uh, Indian consulate, etc., and that can take another eight months, year, something like that. So you're looking at a good 13 to 15 year period. It's not going to happen overnight. Star five, if you have a follow up question. Okay. User 83 says, I got my H1 to H4 change of status approved. H4 EAD approved last year for three years. Started working on H4 EAD. Then I got a letter revoking it. I never received the denial letter. Am I out of status? Yes, if, if they revoked your H4, you're out of status. If they revoked your EAD, but you were never notified, I don't think you're out of status, but you cannot work if they have revoked your EAD. What are my options? Easiest option is make sure that you don't have 180 days and you don't because they seem to have denied that three months ago. Just make sure of that part. If it is less than 180 days, it shouldn't be a problem. You can go get an H4 visa stamping and come back. I don't see any problem with that. And you will have to apply for H4 EAD again because the one that was uh, given earlier is no, no longer good. My wife, my wife might lose her I-140, but she still has seventh year extension. Will that make me eligible for H4 EAD? I believe so. I believe so. Does lawyer get a copy of approval denial? Yes, they do. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, please press star 5. Okay. 
Let me move on to question number 12. My wife and uh, this is from Celtic Spat Socks. Celtic, Celtic Spat Socks. Okay, got it. Uh, my wife and I both have H-1B visas working for separate companies. Wife's company filed I-140 45 EAD. They filed my 45 EAD as well. Her EAD got approved in 10 weeks. I'm still working on H-1B. I'm planning to change jobs and use my EAD. EAD is good for two more years. Can I start working for a new company providing approved EAD card? Of course. Do I need to change my visa from H-1B to dependent? You don't need to, but you can if you want to. Because, see, when 485 is pending, that gives you permission to stay in the United States. You don't need any other status except 485. If you want permission to work, you need to have EAD. If you want permission to travel, you need to have advanced pro. It's as simple as that. Okay. Anybody has a follow-up question on this? Press star five, please. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. Adi says, I'm preparing for CPA and I have to volunteer. I actually have a detailed, not very detailed, just one paragraph. Um, if you go to immigration.com, go to the very top, where it says LinkedIn, okay, and read my articles on my LinkedIn account. One of the article deals about volunteering, and the bottom line I'll give you, immigration law does not prohibit you from volunteering, but Fair Labor Standards Act, which is not immigration law, places certain restrictions on for-profit employers, and those restrictions I have mentioned in that article. Read it through, but as far as you are concerned, yes, you can volunteer for an unpaid job, no benefits, you can. Okay, star five, if there's a follow-up question on this, guys. Star five. Okay. The next question I can't really answer. SG22 says, the rule according to which we can avoid interview at the consulate. That is so specific to a consulate. Remember, State Department lets the consulates make local rules. This is not uniform law. So whatever the local rules are, if they are Sydney, Australia has different rules, New Delhi would have different rules. Actually, within US, within India, they could have different rules if they wanted. I don't see any problem with consulates deciding on local procedures. So. I can't answer this question. This is completely local. So you're going to have to contact the consulate. And usually, by the way, I'm sorry I couldn't help you any better, but consulates do respond to your emails. So, but I'll try to go over your question, see whatever parts I can answer, I will answer. So your visa stamp has expired. You've got H1B extension till 2018. Can I go to Delhi? Yes, you can. Now, what the local rules there are, I don't know. I don't remember them. We review them before we send somebody in. Uh, do I need to go to Sydney, Australia? I do not know the answer to that question. Local rules. What dates are available? That should be available online. I am working at a client side through a vendor. Yes, it's always risky to go for visa stamping in these so-called EVC model cases because government can ask all kinds of questions. They can delay you. They can even deny you. I don't know the merits of your case. You can discuss with your lawyers before you go. But yeah, EVC cases are usually more difficult than in-house direct employment. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. All right, let's take your question. Go ahead, sir, New Jersey. Yeah, hi, Rajiji. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking my question. So, uh, just a, uh, so basically, I understand you said it's a little bit more difficult, but in the recent past, uh, have you seen any of your clients or uh, any of your H1 uh, candidates, uh, you know, getting stuck because of the, you know, uh, they've been working on an EVC model in the recent times, in the last few months? Maybe? Yes, yes. We've had uh, quite a few of them get stuck 
if I were to make a very rough guess, I would say the number is about 50-50. So sometimes they start asking, yeah, sometimes they start asking questions and they ask questions until we can answer no more. And sometimes they have not created problems. I do not know what the rhyme or reason for these variations in similar cases are, but definitely it is a crapshoot. It is a chance that you're going to take. But it has always been easier if a person has been working on H1 but a full-time employee with a certain company. Normally, easier. Yeah. Uh, Normally yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and but, but in the past, uh, if what people even if they were stuck, have they been able to come back maybe after some time, maybe few weeks of delay and things like that, but have they managed to get back? I mean, some of your clients uh, ultimately within few months, maybe few weeks, uh, within, have they ever within, able to get back? Within a few months, yes, especially if they could do two things. One, provide verification of the nature of relationship and the degree of control, etc. from an end client. Or, and also sometimes the consulate wants to call the end client to verify. So if those these two things were readily available, it ultimately worked out. But sometimes it could take months. So I always advised people, I said, listen, if you're going to go, make sure you're prepared for a delay or even a denial. Now, remember, a denial, unless it involves some kind of fraud, does not mean somebody else can't file an H-1 for you unless you have a quota issue. Okay. So denial by itself doesn't bother me. Second thing I tell people is that if it's if you're going to get delayed, make sure you're not going to lose your job. And one good way to do this is to be able to kind of outsource the work to yourself. So if you can work from India, you could do that. And they can pay you either your full salary in USA, your full salary in India, or a much smaller salary if they, say, if they so choose, because they are not working under US laws. OK? So that, okay. in a nutshell, is your situation. Sure. So one uh, uh, related thing was, I mean, there's an employer employee relationship, so we should also carry the document which can prove that, uh, you know, maybe I'm sending the status report to them and so forth, right? So that that should also be taken. There is two, uh, I think what I heard from some of my friends was that you know, they try to uh, verify employer employee relationship uh, through some documents, emails, and things like that. Well, typically they want to see a letter from the end client. But yes, you should carry whatever okay. evidence you can carry. Also remember, okay. whatever evidence was submitted to the USCIS, that evidence is available to the consulate because they have a complete copy of it in the PIMS database. Okay. 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 All right. So last question. Uh, because of the H4 condition of my wife, she's already on EAD. If I, if I, uh, I, the question I, I uh, question I had was that you know maybe I will send her alone, you know, H four because I think H four should be much easier, uh, correct? Is that true statement? Is H four easier as compared to H one camping? Normally, yes. Okay, okay, and uh, the follow up thing was that if H four is if my H one is you know refiled, maybe if something like uh, if H one is, uh, for example, my job change is. And I have to file my H1 again, just in case I don't wish to. Uh, in that case, the EAD with the H4 uh, person or the spouse already has, is that does that also get impacted because the H1 is being refiled and you never know how much paid or number of years you might get extended for a new H1 just because your job location changed. Does that also impact on the EAD, the, your spouse is having, or that does not, have, does not get impacted with that? It does not impact. Just because an H-1 holder is changing jobs or amending his H-1 or extending his H-1 does not automatically affect the H-4 holder. What can affect the H-4 holder is either because her own status is expiring or where you have had some violation of status. For example, if you work without authorization, then she's affected. Just change of jobs or extensions or amendments don't affect her at all. Okay, so if she's working on a certain place, she can continue to work in uh, without being impacted by my H1 extension or change of the or anything like that. So she, she can continue working wherever she's working. Yes, sir. That is correct. Awesome. So, thank right. you, sir. Thank you, you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck.
Okay, so Natty Bai says, I am on L1 with company A. H1 was employ, applied in 2015 through company B. It was approved. Well, the key issue here is was change of status approved. Because if change of status was not approved, then USCIS can take the position. I think they are wrong, but they can take the position, and they often do, that your H1 was not perfected. So you are still subject to the quota. If you are cap exempt, you can work for any employer. But the problem is we don't know if you are cap exempt because I don't know if you got change of status. If you are on the phone, press star 5. We will need that information. Did you get change of status approved? Okay. Let me make sure you haven't said that. Yeah, you haven't said that, so I don't really don't know. And if you are cap exempt, you can work for any employer, get them to file the H1. If you are cap subject, then you are cap subject. You've got to start all over again. Indian Visa says, I'm on H1B, I want to go for stamping. My LCA and DS-160 says, I am a business analyst, but client letter, vendor letter says business systems consultant. See, the most important thing is the duties and responsibilities. Minor variations in the job title are not of major concern to me. I like to have them consistent, but if you have these minor variations, and if you're getting more money than your LCSS, I think that should be okay. So I'm not that concerned about it. Of course, you can get a 221G because there is a difference in the job titles. Higher salary is not going to be an issue as far as I can see. Press star five if you have a follow-up question. There you are, okay. Also New Jersey, go ahead please. Uh, thank you so much for answering that. So, uh, uh, there is a possibility of 221G. How long would it take, uh, in general, how long would it take for it to be clarified? So, uh, I just want to make sure that I have a job here and then my client answers any RFE questions that he gets from the visa department. Sure. I cannot predict how long, ma'am, because it could be as little as a few weeks or, or it can be as much as a few months. So that is impossible to predict. Okay, okay. And, and sir, one more question. So uh, I, I've been talking to my employer to change my LCA to business systems consultant, and he's been saying that there is no code as such in the USCIS code, and he cannot do that. So I just wanted to understand if it is a real case or... Well, LCAs cannot be amended. LCAs can be filed again, but they can't be amended. Mm -hmm. The problem is an LCA that has been filed again does not, cannot be retroactive. So you have those issues as well. I guess I, it's difficult. For, ideal situation would be, ma'am, if you just went ahead and did an H-1B amendment to reflect a consistency in the titles across, that removes any doubt that we might have. But frankly, business systems consultant or business analyst does not appear to be especially where the job descriptions are same or similar, I don't think they are that far apart. My guess would be you should be okay. Okay, okay. Thank All you right. so much, sir. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, let's go to... I can't figure out sometimes this. Okay, here we are. All right. Uh, next question is from SSK. This is question number 17 I'm reading. Regarding my son who's eight years old on H4. So now his old passport ended on August 1st. Approval has I-94 number listed. So there's a difference in I-94 numbers. Well, let's take a couple of steps back from this. I hope you're on the phone. If you are, press star 5. SSK, press star 5. Okay, you're not here. All right. First of all, just for your general knowledge, people who are under the age of 18 cannot accrue unlawful presence, which means they don't really have a huge danger of incurring any permanent damage to their immigration status under the age of 18. 
Okay. So we don't need to worry about it right now. I-94 numbers don't bother me that much, okay? So what you may want to do is, I guess one of the options is I-797 approval to the same I-94 number. I guess the easiest thing to do is just get him a H-4 visa stamp and bring him back on H-4, and that should take care of all these issues. You could even make an appointment in Canada or Mexico. That appears to be the shortcut to this situation. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Okay. Love Imi Reform. Love Imi Reform is I-140 approved from employer A planning to move to B. They are going to, A is going to request revocation of I-140. Can I retain my priority date? And the answer is as of today, yes. I don't know what USCIS will think tomorrow, but today they allow you. I've been working in USA for six plus years for the same employer, L1B, four and a half years, H1B, two years. You should be able to get three years of H1 extension Normally, once your I-140 is approved, you should be able to get three years extension. And the problem is for H4 EAD, because you have a, an extension beyond six years, I think you should be able to get an H4 EAD for your spouse as well. Visa stamping I have discussed a couple of times today. So you should review our discussion from before that H1 visa stamping is very difficult to predict. And in my opinion, if you get visa stamping done from employer A and then transfer over to employer B, you can use the same visa. Consulates have made some noises about, no, we want you to apply again. But their own rules don't seem to support that situation. So I am telling people we don't need a new visa stamping in those cases. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, star 5. Okay. Jane, US 99. H1B, I-140 is approved. Priority date is 2013. H-1B will expire in April 2017. My extension may start with the present company in October 2016. I may join company B and they will file for H-1B extension. So whoever does my H-1B extension, A and B. If I go to India and complete stamping before my extension, can I use same stamping till it ends or with new extension? You see, that's not a problem. Uh, I have discussed this issue also in detail today. If you listen to the rest of my discussions, the same issue has been discussed. So let's say you've got an extension pending and you travel. You come back and then your extension gets approved. First of all, you can return within the life of your H-1 visa as long as you've been maintaining status. Then your H-1 extension gets approved, it's fine. But if your H-1 extension gets approved while you are gone, now the problem is your extension is approved for let's say three years, but when you come back, your I-94 will be good only for the next month, two months, three months, six months, whatever the time there is. So you'll have to probably go out and get visa stamping done again or apply for um, an H-1 extension all over again. So those will be the two choices if the extension is approved in your absence. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Okay. Tony, Tony was on the phone earlier. I have told him to call back because I'm going to do a separate call with him. We can go on to the last question. EB1C I-140 is denied, 45 is denied. Primary beneficiary has not used green card maintaining H-1B status. 
H for spouse used EAD for a month. GC EAD for spouse is valid till Feb 2017. Can they work? I think they should stop working. These days what they are doing is they'll send a notice out saying you've got to stop working uh, within 12 days or within 18 days if the 45 is not pending. So I, I would probably want you to stop working or your spouse to stop working. Primary beneficiary has approved I-140 from the same employer for an EB-2 filing. Can we do an H-4 EAD? Yes, yes. I think the spouse should get an H-4 visa stamping because there's some question about status or she can just go outside USA, come back using her H-4 visa and then you should apply for an EAD, H-4 EAD. I don't see any problem with that. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, guys. Okay, any question from anyone, new, old, doesn't matter. Star 5, please. 1, 2, 3, 4. Anyone has any question, new or old? Four, five, okay. We've got five people with raised hands. Is that it, guys? No more, no more questions? We'll do these five and then we'll call it a day, okay? No more questions after that. I'm doing these five questions. Okay, so let's go in the order that you guys logged in. Let's go to Florida. Florida, go ahead with your question, please. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Good my question was, I wrote you an email about the thing. Um, I'm going for my second uh, H-1 visa stamping to India next month. Um, however, my question was regarding the marital status that I need to file on the S-160. Um, I just had a, my passport renewal uh, done uh, from Atlanta uh, two months ago. Um, however, uh, I did not include my spouse's name on my passport. Um, the reason being uh, that we are going to legally separate, but that hasn't started yet uh, until I go to India. Uh, but she was here on H-4 visa uh, last year. So uh, when I file a DS-160, uh, do I file as married or do I file as divorced or do I file as something else? Um, okay. that's, that, that's related to uh, Until you are legally divorced, you are still married. So obviously, your status is married. Okay. Uh, my question to that one is, if my spouse's name is not reflecting on my renewed passport, is that going to be a problem? I don't see why, because you have a very good explanation for it. Okay, um, so just one more question after that is, since there are no dates for the interview, um, there is a new program called the Dropbox. I know. Uh, so I was going to avail that opportunity where uh, it's, I'm, I'm working for the same company, it's just the same visa, and I, I, I complete all the eligibility for the Dropbox, so I was going to avail that opportunity. So do you think that would be an issue? Because I won't have a face-to-face -face interview with the officer. I don't think that's an issue. Okay. So uh, not having a spouse's name on passport and putting a marital status is, is not an issue. As long as you're upfront about whatever you are asked, if you are asked something, as long as you're upfront about filling out the forms, honestly, I don't see any problem. Okay. All right. Uh, just a second. Uh, quick, uh, yeah, I'm gonna second I'm gonna have to cut you short. I've got four other people waiting, so make it really quick. I can give you five more seconds. Okay. All right. Uh, my company has filed my I one forty. My I one forty is approved. So D, on DS one sixty, when they ask, uh, "Have you filed for immigration petition?" Do you say yes or no? The answer is yes. I one forty is an immigrant visa petition. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, guys, let's go to New York. New York, go ahead, please. New York. New York. Hello, sir. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks and appreciate, Mr. Raji, for your giving your time. So the thing is, uh, my L1A visa is expiring on March 2017. 
Okay. And my company is ready to file green card in PB1C category. Okay. Although they filed in PB2 earlier, I-140 is cleared, but uh, that will not help in extension. So the thing is, the final action cut off date, priority date in EB1 for August 2016 is January 2010. But filing the eligibility cut off, that is the date of filing is current. So the question is, can I file I-140 and I-485 concurrently as the final cut off date is not current, but the filing eligibility is current and then I can extend my stay here. You're going to have to talk with your lawyers. I haven't looked at the visa bulletin. Uh, somebody else in the firm takes care of all that. Let me, other people take care of all the details. Let me just tell you this. If USCIS website says that you can file your application from this month forward, then of course you go with the USCIS website. So you should go from USCIS website to the visa bulletin, not the other way around. There's a USCIS website, there's a page that talks about what the current filing dates for the 485 are. When they say current, that means next month's dates usually. So in September, they give you dates for October. I know the new visa bulletin is out. Whatever those dates are, follow them from the USCIS website. Okay? Okay, so filing the uh, if filing cutoff date is current, so I can file together I-140 and 485. I have no idea what the dates for the next month are. If you're allowed to file the 485, you file it. I cannot really comment about that because, like I told you, I haven't seen the visa bulletin. Okay? Okay, thanks. Just go to, go to the USCIS. Hang on. Go to the USCIS website and follow back from there. Don't go to the visa bulletin first. Go to USCIS website. People who are filing 485 should follow from USCIS website back. Okay? Go ahead. What were you saying, sir? Uh, the mandatory uh, is it mandatory to complete one year stay in India as a manager to file in EB1 category or uh, if something is like seven or eight months stay is fine is fine to file in EB1. It is exactly one year. I suggest 366 days, not a day less. Okay. It's, okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, let's go to, this is also New Jersey, then I have California, and then I have Minnesota. So let's go to New Jersey first. New Jersey, go ahead, please. Uh, hey, uh, Rajivji, uh, this is Nick. Uh, uh, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, Nick, yes. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, sure. I'll just go quickly. I mean, it has been a complicated question, but, you know, I am on I-140 approved and okay. beyond six years of extension. Okay. Uh, I would like to join a new company. Okay. Uh, so now I'm, my first question is, will I get a three years extension based on the old employer I-140? Uh, when is your current extension ex expiring? Uh, it will be expired in March 2017. I think you will get six, three years, yes. And uh, the other question is like, uh, will I, uh, I have, I mean, my new employer will, you know, probably put me into a Canada. So if I have the three years of extension, can I go for a Canada one year work there, right, and come back on the same match only? Yes. Okay. Uh, the other question is, based on my old I-140, can if I, if I go to India, can I be actually be kept exempt, or do I have to go for a lottery? If well, mm -hmm. let's 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 take that step. But there are a bunch of sub questions there that I may not have time to go over in complete detail. But if you are outside USA for more than one year, and you still have time remaining on your original H one, you'll have two choices. You can either come back for the remaining time, call the remainder option, or you will be subject to the quota and you can take six more years of H1. So that becomes a choice at that point of time. I'm making it very simple, but discuss it with your lawyers. There is a lot much more going on here, a lot more going on here than what I'm able to tell you in the four or five minutes that we have. Okay, so theoretically, all of this is possible. Next question. 
so uh, based on my old i140 so like my new my and if i my new employer will file my new action action right but let's say if they are, they are not able to complete i140 and form right then i have to go back to india the question is is it possible for me to apply h1b in a cap exempt based on old i140 uh, or do i have to go for a lottery one one very important question that i didn't understand nick um is your old employer oh, excuse me for a second i've got a bunch of twitter notifications let's make sure okay new followers all right uh is your old employer going to revoke your i140 i don't know sir that's the yes, most sir. important question because if at the time of your next extension the i140 is revoked you cannot use that to get a i140 extension somebody just raised their hand guys i'm not going to take any more new questions put it down because i had said five people and five people it is that's all we'll be doing yeah go ahead nick so yeah as long as the i140 is not revoked you can get h1 extension if it is revoked you can't extend you can only extend based upon the next employer's green card okay uh, well, folks, uh, people who are, uh, mean, hang on yeah. one second. Let me just make one thing clear. Folks who have just logged in, I will not be taking new questions at this point of time. We've got already people lined up. So sorry about that. you got to log in earlier if you want to be in the queue. Go ahead, Nick. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if I am if I'm in India and I don't have uh, H1 extension or H1 visa now because, you know, my six years has been done, and I went back to India. My question is, can I join a new employer? And my can I have a H1 visa applied based on I140, which is old employer, and it will still approve? And not I don't think off? so. The rules are much more complicated in that situation. But I think you will be okay. subject to the quota, and you will have to take um, um, the route under quota. You can't be quota exempt. If you're outside for more than one year, your only way back in, if your I-140 is revoked, is to come through quota with six new year, six more years of uh, H-1. Okay? i got to take my next call. Okay. Good Thanks luck. Enough. Good luck. Thanks a lot, sir. You are. Thanks a lot. California, go ahead, please. California. LA. Yeah, uh, good morning, Rakesh Ji. Good morning, Ji. This is uh, Fareed. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question, uh, uh, let me give you my scenario. I have, uh, I am on TD status. Okay. And I have applied for H1 transfer. Okay. Um, um, change of status on August 11th of uh, 2015. Okay. And uh, I received a, uh, an RFE on February 11th, 2016. Okay. okay. And uh, my employer sent the response back on May uh, 11th, 2016. Okay. Uh, but I have not received any reply even uh, as of now. Okay. So, however, I have uh, an urgent situation where I have to go to India. So my question, number one is, can I travel during this period? And if yes, will I be able to get a visa stamping in India if uh, the visa goes through and my employer can send the documents? Are uh, you, ma'am, are you are you a citizen yes. of Canada or no? Uh, I am not a citizen of Canada, but my husband is a citizen okay. of Canada. I have uh, Indian all, passport. All right. all right. Well, here is the problem. When you travel outside while a change of status is pending, as you must know, the change of status is abandoned. Now, if you are able to get a visa, good. You can try for a visa. If you get an H-1 visa, you are fine. But if the visa is denied, then you are still subject to the quota you'll have to come back on your TD, okay? Okay. Uh, so, um, if my if I don't, if my visa status does not change at all, can I come back on my uh, T, uh, on, during this period? If you have traveled outside while change of status is pending, your change of status is yeah. gone, but your TD is intact. You can come back on TD, no problem. 
Okay, uh, but here, um, Mr. Rajiv, the thing is, last time my passport, when I traveled out, my visa was stamped for uh, H1. I was working when I had traveled, and I had the H1 stamp. So you'll and hang on, hang on, TD? hang on. You'll need to apply for a TD visa. Okay. See, normally, okay. if you are a Canadian, if you are okay. a Canadian, ma'am, let me finish. If you are a Canadian citizen, you don't need a TD visa. But if your husband is on TN, he's a Canadian citizen, but you are not a Canadian citizen, you need a TD visa. Okay. Okay? Okay. Good luck. Okay. Um, I, okay. I, I got or alternately, can I withdraw my application and uh, come back and apply for H1 premium processing? Will, if, be, will there be any negative connotations for me in terms of applying for a green card or any, uh, applying for H1 again, Rajiti? Um, I'm going to make this the last question. I've got two more people waiting. Let's, let's, say, let's okay. put it this way. Look, there is no negative connotation in anything that you do legally. There's never any negative connotation. But what you're asking me has so many different subsets of issues that I can see. Are you subject to the quota? Have you had an H1 before? Uh, you know, there are so many different things going on here. I cannot cover them in the time that we have. You need to talk to your lawyers. I can cover this much. If you leave USA while your change of status is pending, that is deemed to be a bad. You can come back on your TD, but then you won't have cap exemption. Okay. Good, okay. good luck. Thank you so much. You're Have welcome. a great day. Bye-bye. You too, man. Bye-bye. Guys, I strongly recommend that you post your questions ahead of time. Because when you post, then I know exactly what you're asking. I try to answer everything. But if you ask me at the end of a conference call, I am short of time. I do my best, but we may not have time to cover all aspects of what you're asking me and try to keep your questions short. Okay, let's go to New Jersey, and then we've got Minnesota. That's it. Uh, New Jersey, go ahead, please. New Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, hi, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you, yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, the, this one was, uh, you know, we, the visa interview, uh, which we have to take some time online, uh, normally, we don't know what dates are available until we go and register after that date. So, is the payment also required to report? Can you see what dates are available? Or uh, we can we have a way to get at least know the date before we make the payment? Because sometimes the decision to go or not... You're, asking, call, me, you you're asking me a level of detail which I have no clue. See, I am the legal guy. I take care of all the legal issues. Other people in our firm okay. take care of all these details. I am not involved with them. So, I am okay. sorry. I have no idea. No, no, my sir. Uh, lastly, uh, there is a that uh, there was a recently uh, a two separate date for filing EAD, you know, final yes. and yes. three final plus. You know, is yes. there any expectation of moving that? I mean, again, we don't have no See, some, some here, here's here is my problem. Here is my problem. The way I look at it, the mathematics is rather simple. Overall math, the number of applications uh -huh. has number of applications has not decreased. The number of available green cards has not increased. I don't see how there can be any drastic improvement. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I gotta take okay. my, my next call. Okay. Good luck, sir. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we are. Let's see. Minnesota, go ahead, please. Minnesota. Hello, sir. My question is, uh, I got my employer a did my H-1B uh, filing, which will be effective as of October 1. It will start of, as of October 1. Let's say I change my job and move over to uh, employer B and employer B transfers my H-1. I work with them for an year or more than that, and then my project gets over and they withdraw their H-1B versus and at the same time employer A had not withdrawn their H-1B for next let's say two years. So will I will I be able to come back to the original no. H1 which was for No, this this hypothetical has a fundamental flaw. 
the fundamental flaw is this. Your employers are required by law to revoke your H1 if you leave them. Okay, so there's a fundamental flaw in that you are assuming that the old employer will not revoke your H1. Now, there are situations in which you're just gone a few weeks and the revocation has not occurred. Can you rejoin the old employer? I think you can. I think you can. There have been situations where I'll give you an example. I remember reading this comment from USCIS a few weeks ago. They said, let's say you are working for employer A, just like you are, and employer B files for your transfer. Now the receipt comes, you join employer B on the receipt. But if for some reason employer B's case is denied and employer A has not revoked your H1, USC has said we don't mind if you go back to work for employer A. That's sort of your situation. The only difference is instead of the difference in the two cases being a few weeks apart, you're talking about a year, and I think that may not be acceptable to USCIS. Okay? Okay. But, but I, I want to clarify, I, I want to clarify one thing. There's nothing stopping the old employer from refiling an H1. They can refile the transfer. So they can always bring you back with a new H1. Okay? And are you recap exempt? Yes, of course. Once your H1 is approved and you worked on it, there is no question that you are now cap exempt. Okay. All right? Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, guys. I will talk with you again in... Oh, let me just make sure on the Twitter. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you again in two weeks. As always, I enjoy myself tremendously when I speak with you folks. And I thank you for the opportunity to hang out with you. Two weeks next to next Thursday. Bye now. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time and um, you know it's instantaneous it happens right away and post your questions beforehand or you can just log in uh, the phone number and all are provided 202-800-8394 1230 eastern standard time every other thursday we have uh, free apps for both apple ios platform for your iphones and ipads as well as for android just look for immigration.com immigration.com the period dot and uh, the application should show up